just give another minute here. But uh, again, we are glad you joined us today. This is uh, Getting Civil with Dynamo with Saul Amor and uh, Jacob Small. So <laughs> we got Andy <laughs> Van Dam by the River, of course. Paul, Wisconsin. That's funny. Always Which becomes pro. what river? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another minute here. You gentlemen ready to go? We are. Let's do it. All right. Let's get going. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Sean Hurley. I'm a community engagement manager with Autodesk Community. Um, Want to welcome you to today's community conversation. We're joined by the talented Jacob Small and Solomar. Today, we'll be discussing Dynamo and Civil. Community conversations are virtual meetups featuring expert speakers like the two we have today that can range from deep dives, tips and tricks, live demos on products such as AutoCAD, Revit, Dynamo, Fusion 360, to roundtable on industry insights, emerging trends and career stories, and a lot more. I mean, they can cover anything. All experience levels are covered from beginning to expert. Um, so let's get into the fun stuff, the rules. <laughs> this is a real simple kind of an abstract one with Dynamo, but uh, uh, any, any, any statements we make that uh, uh, are forward-looking, disregard those. Make any purchasing decisions, subscription decisions based on the products as they ship today. So if Sol happens to talk about putting fur on Dynamo uh, UIs, he can't promise you that. Only make those decisions based on what's in the product today and how, how the features are. That would be cool though, you know, contextual or not contextual, that'd be a uh, pertextual. Anyway, next. Tactile please. feedback, I like that. Tactile, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> uh, all right, the fun oh. stuff. Uh, everyone's line is muted to reduce background noise. We do invite you to keep your camera on, just kind of get this all in the same room feeling. And speaking of that, AU is gonna be in person this year in September and we could be all in the same room and maybe we could do one of the, the uh, um, Dynamo office hours live. That would be fun. And every time they mention the word generative, you have to drink. But uh, um, anyway, that's, yeah, that, that's going to get dangerous very quickly. I know. Because <laughs> you'll say it every other sentence. Mm -hmm. um, the conversation is that it should be a conversation. So we ask you to raise your hand and we'll unmute your line or you can post your questions in the chat. Um, so the session is being recorded. We will mail you a link um, as well. It will be on this. this uh, um, event page where you RSVP'd and I'll post that here in the chat in just a second. Um, next, please. That's the wrong way. There we are. Again, I'm Sean Hurley. I'm uh, Autodesk Community Engagement Manager. I'm a geeky technologist in Bend, Oregon. And I am Jacob Small. I'm a technical consultant focusing on generative design um, based out of Boston, Massachusetts. But not today. Yeah, but not today. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sol. I am the uh, Autodesk Product Manager at Dynamo. So uh, guiding the development and the direction and the growth of Dynamo over time. Describe myself as a curious human being and based here in Boston, Massachusetts, but originally from New Zealand. All right. So thank you all so much for joining us today. This is uh, session number 24 in our Dynamo Office Hour series, I would call it Getting Civil with Dynamo. And as per the session last week, uh, last time, uh, thanks to Jacob for flying solo on that one around getting into Revit and Dynamo or the connection between. Today, we talk a little bit about the civil connection with Dynamo and what that means inside of the context of Civil 3D when you start playing with Dynamo and what it has to offer. So as per usual, we're gonna have a bit of a presentation. Whoops, on oh, the Revit icon, sorry, I forgot to update that one. That should be a civil icon. Uh, but it's gonna be around about a 20 minute presentation uh, around getting civil with Dynamo. Uh, there's gonna be a live demonstration from Jacob. It's gonna do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, and then there's gonna be a bit of a Q and A session. But as Sean mentioned earlier, please do feel free to write in the chat or to put your hand up, come off mute and ask a question during the conversation because it is really that it's a conversation. It's not supposed to be a presentation per se. So we would really encourage and try to foster that kind of engagement. All right, without further ado, we'll get into the guts of the stuff today. So first of all, uh, if you're familiar with Civil 3D and Dynamo or if you're not, 
Uh, there's a couple of differences when it comes to how Civil 3D uses Dynamo compared to some of our other host integrations. So in the context of Revit, there was a singular Revit entry here inside of Civil 3D, we actually have two entries into the library that come with the integration of Civil 3D and Dynamo. So these two separate categories are of Civil 3D and AutoCAD. And the basic difference here is that the AutoCAD uh, category spans pan Autodesk things. So in the future, if we have an integration into other Autodesk verticals, uh, sorry, AutoCAD verticals or AutoCAD itself, this would be directly transferable into that space. And then we have the Civil 3D specific flavors of elements here, you know, such as document and selection paradigms. Uh, and this will come through only for Civil 3D. Those would not be transferred into any other host realm. So this provides a, a clear distinction and delineation between what is base AutoCAD and what is specific to Civil 3D and also enables, like I said, that transferability in the future. So a little bit of forward thinking on that front. All right, so next up, oh, Adam Riley's here, that's awesome. Uh, good to see you, Adam. Uh, I would love to see your Sheet Set Manager package listed in that AutoCAD section, but we'll talk more on that in a few. Um, the next thing you really need to know as you get started with Civil is that unlike the Revit add-in, uh, Revit Dynamo integration, and some of the other Dynamo integrations, um, you have to be very particular about where you wanna record your data. So you have to make sure that uh, if, you know, you're calling out the right document, you have to make sure that you're calling out the right block, even if it's the model space that you're looking to do the work in. Otherwise, Dynamo doesn't really know where you want to write this content, right? So that's why we have some of these extra pieces. Now, one thing that can be super helpful, and you can see it in the uh, uh, screenshot on the right hand side there, is to build a couple custom functions, in particular, one to call the current document and one to call model space. Uh, otherwise, you wind up placing a lot of the same couple nodes on Canvas over and over and over again. Uh, but once you build these simple functions in, uh, you can call them uh, pretty consistently and constantly and a little bit faster than having to dig around and find some of those extra nodes. So uh, this is one area where I really, really, really recommend uh, design script and custom definitions. Uh, the other thing to know about uh, is uh, your objects, your civil 3D objects uh, do come over uh, as objects. Just about everything that you're going to bring over is actually going to be an object. Similar to on the Revit side, we had everything that comes over as an element. Over here, it's an object. Um, if you just assume that what you have is an object of some type, you can get about 50% of the initial confusion with the integration kind of out of the way. Uh, now, objects will show their object type as sort of their identifier. And you have to be a little bit careful here because as you can see here on this screenshot, I selected some objects that list out what their handle is, uh, which is a useful bit. We'll talk a bit more on that later. Uh, but then on the right hand side there, it just says circle. It doesn't let me know that it's an AutoCAD circle or a Dynamo circle, it just says circle. So it can be a little bit confusing. Uh, that is where the object.type node can really help out to sort of ensure that we know that we're working with an AutoCAD circle as opposed to a Dynamo circle. Uh, if you get a little bit more detailed of the preview on there, the Dynamo circle actually has, you know, calls out its center point and some other information about it uh, rather than just stating circle. All right, uh, from here, we'll get into our specific objects. Uh, specific objects will actually uh, are really great because it can sort of help you get to the content that you're looking for much quicker. Um, the first piece up uh, is the capability to basically move uh, generic categories like objects, uh, particularly where you, where you want them to be. Now, um, the, the one thing to note here is when you're in your less specific data type, uh, you either won't have any constructors versus your very specific data type, block reference shown on the right hand side here. Your constructors, if you have them on the less specific are gonna be really generic. They're gonna be used for basic, super simple primitives. So if you wanna do something that's a little bit more complex, don't go to the object section, go to the specific section. So you can see there, we've got our specific constructor to be able to, our constructors to be able to create our block references. Now, the object side of things, uh, you do have a little bit more stuff that you can do with stuff, generally speaking. That's because the bulk of your big picture changes are actually going to be listed over here, uh, where you know things can happen to many pieces. So object.geometry will pull the geometry from whatever objects we might have. And we're going to talk a bit more about geometry in a couple slides. Whereas over on the uh, specific side, there's a little bit less stuff you can do because it's just the stuff that is particular to that specific type of object. So um, 
generally speaking, if you're looking for something, I recommend starting on the very uh, specific side and then starting to get into the more generic side with object as your next step. Awesome. So then we want to talk a little bit about the organization of things. So this is when you want to create stuff, change stuff, or examine stuff to see what it's all about. So similar to the Revit integration, Silver 3D has the same kind of base operations, similar to Dynamo Sandbox and the core uh, experience of Dynamo here. So constructors, which Jacob was just talking about a little bit, it enables you to make new things. So in this case, we have a, an example of Kogo points. We're looking that, to a constructors that we can either create by block reference or by geometry. This, so this enables you to create new objects. Then we have a section, uh, or, and the constructor is demarcated by this green plus here inside of Dynamo. Then we have the second set, which is uh, called a method or a modification or an action, which enables us to alter things. So this is the case of setting uh, property values, uh, doing things like rotation, uh, understanding uh, how to translate elements and so on. So in the case of Kogo points here, we get to do things like set their name and set their raw description. And then the third one we have, which is demarcated by a blue question mark, is the query function or the properties of an object. So in this case, it's just simply telling you information. This is kind of like a, a read only. It just gives you something. You don't really do much with it unless you explicitly downstream create something from that it's more of a case of here is the information that is currently associated with my object and i can then read it understand it and potentially do something later if i want to so once again with the organization of things check out the ui library session for more information that gets a little bit deeper into understanding how to navigate that space And then specifically around constructing things, uh, when you want to create things inside of uh, Civil 3D and Dynamo specifically, uh, again, selecting the right method is a bit of an art form as opposed to a scientific methodology. So start specific, like Jacob said, and then move an abstraction further out uh, if you need to. And so you have to get your head sort of wrapped a little bit around about how to make things and how to create things from sort of an API perspective as opposed to a UI perspective. Now, Often they are related, but sometimes they are not. And so it's awesome when they are because you have that sort of embedded knowledge inside of your head already to be able to do that. And that translates back into the Dynamo space. So when possible, use the UI equivalent. Uh, they may or may not exist, but typically they do, which is awesome. So you have that pairing or that relationship between them. And it's also, again, easiest to create an object and then apply a transform later as opposed to trying to do it in the opposite direction. So this is often how buttons inside of programs like Civil 3D also operate. So if you want to create and then rotate an object, for example, that might be a sequence of events that is just encapsulated into a single button inside of Civil 3D. Whereas in Dynamo, we then express that uh, as multiple different function operations. So first we create something and then we go and rotate that thing in two discrete steps. Next thing to go over is object properties. Uh, this is where you really get to start playing with all the data. Uh, properties are great because, you know, it's it's sort of the the information aspect of, you know, BIM of your uh, sort of connected civil environment. Um, and they allow you to move data much faster than some of the other uh, object types, right? If we wanna move geometry, geometry is slow to move, but properties, super quick because it's easier data to sort of serialize and marshal across. Um, so uh, when possible, try and stick to these properties uh, where we're gonna sort of write the properties to the CAD object or read the data into the Dynamo memory. To get a little bit more into properties, uh, you do have access to property sets. There are some very particular nodes for property sets, but they're spread all across the library, right? Uh, so if you wanna sort of update a value of a property, you're gonna do that through the object category, uh, there's a uh, update property node. Uh, if you want to sort of uh, attach a property and that again, or property set to an object that again is going to be in the object category. Uh, if you want to get the value of a particular property, once you've pulled it, you're going to get that from the uh, properties category, which is under property set. Uh, and then quick selection can also be done uh, using the selection category by property. So you basically give it the property set give it the property name and then the value and are you looking for equal, less than, greater than, et cetera, uh, to quickly filter that content. And you can also query your sets under the document category. Now there's a great AU session uh, that goes over some of the stuff that you can do with property sets uh, because we don't have all the time to get into this. It's uh, unlocking the mystery of scripting, uh, Dynamo Civil 3D introduction uh, from AU 2019. 
uh, which was actually presented by uh, Joe Wen uh, Luo and uh, Andrew Milford, I believe. Uh, and they did a great job uh, with that set. It's a great sort of quick introduction for all the cool stuff. So if you want more civil stuff, uh, you can go check that out. Uh, awesome. And then we move on to object handles. So this is a, a way to create a reliable connection between different objects. And so there's only really two points here. And the first one is that every object has an object handle. Uh, these are sequentially created. So we have to be a little bit cautious with them, but there is an awesome uh, object handle node. I think it's from the Civil Connection Toolkit, correct, Jacob? Uh, which allows you to understand what those, uh, those object handles are. So you notice on the slide earlier that Jacob was showing uh, that there was the object handles in the selection node, which was great, but they didn't transfer into the node secondarily downstream. It could be useful to use this object handle node there and create a filtration set or a dictionary of elements that you can then refer to back later in a way that is, uh, you know, paired or, or cr has created this kind of reliable connection between things. So the other point here on this on the slide is object handles are available and reliable within the same DWG drawing. Uh, they are not necessarily reliable when you start to span across multiple different DWG drawings. Uh, Jacob, I don't know if you have anything to add on this particular point. Yeah, effectively, because the data is created um, in the DWG sequentially, um, if you look for a handle in drawing one and you know try that same handle in drawing two you're going to likely find an object if it's an early enough handle and people haven't deleted stuff uh, but it's not necessarily going to be the same thing that you're looking for uh, so you want to be real careful about sort of using this uh, uh, sequentially uh, to, as sort of a way to sort of go between property set is a much better way to sort of filter this stuff but handles are useful so we wanted to make sure we got to talk about it a bit Thanks. All right, so around performance, again, this is the same message that you would have heard beforehand in both the Revit connection sessions and how to make Dynamo sing, uh, the session specifically on making Dynamo as performant and speedy as humanly possible. So for all you speed demons out there, take note of the following points. Uh, reduce the number of times you have to either marshal or serialize objects to increase speed. So serialization is when information is written to the DYN file, which is then able to be used at a later date when you open up that graph again. And marshalling is, trans is the transmission or changing of data from one particular language through other steps of languages to then get executed in the virtual machine and then marshal back up to data that is human readable. So if you can sort of reduce the number of times you have to do either of those two steps, you're gonna increase the speed of your working environment inside of Dynamo. So please do check out the uh, Make Dynamo Sing session for more deep dive information on this. One like particular example here is that if you use math or abstract geometry over physical sort of tangible geometry, you actually can have a much better, swifter uh, experience working with that. So we're talking about vectors, we're talking about coordinate systems, we're talking about simple math operations to try and move things and then just move them to that location as opposed to create something, rotate that thing, and move that thing in another direction. It's gonna be a little bit slower. So the takeaways here, uh, less memory use is faster, great. Uh, and less geometry is faster. But the caveat on the geometry one is, you know, real tangible geometry as opposed to abstract stuff. Great. And then I think this one here is also gonna help uh, save you a lot of time too. So in both time and sanity, which is around filtering. So if you've used Dynamo, uh, you'll notice that filtering before, uh, is a huge part of the work that you do. So making sure that you get the right kind of stuff uh, before you do something to it. And so as you'll see on screen here, this is a similar um, presentation uh, image from last time, is that if you start with 840 different things and run through a series of different filtering operations, you're gonna get down to the elements you actually, or the objects you actually want to work with, which in this case might only be 25 different things. But if you're pulling in from a generic selection methodology, maybe you're collecting every single block reference inside of your civil program, then you might be collecting a huge number of elements and you don't necessarily want to work with all of them. So there's different ways to filter and it's very much a key in working with Dynamo in general, as well as the civil 3D interaction. And this is through things like, oh, you can filter with your initial selection, if you're using selection objects or paradigms, you can filter with nodes as it's shown on screen right now here, or you can also use things like Python and build your own different API calls to filter specifically to conditions that you want. So heavy selection, which is just sort of like more of a, a brute force method of selecting everything is almost always gonna over stuff that you don't need. So you're gonna have to do some kind of filtering uh, operation. Again, 
all block, block references as being an example here. Uh, what you want to do is get down to the smallest possible number of elements you want to do something to as fast as humanly possible, because all of that data will transfer downstream through the nodes. So if you get to the smallest uh, piece of data, in this case, 25 elements, you're only going to want to have to have 25 elements getting operated on as opposed to 840 different elements. So filtering early, much better than filtering later. Well said. Next up is how to get geometry, right? So uh, this is a big piece of any kind of CAD BIM workflow uh, where you know we're we're talking about the built environment. So we probably want to know what shape that environment is, right? Uh, so the only real way to get most geometry for at least all the uh, sort of AutoCAD style objects is the object dot geometry node. Uh, this works for pretty much everything that has geometry. Now, one thing to note. Uh, is block references do not have geometry. That's right, I'm gonna say it again. The block references we all know and love do not have geometry. You actually have to take the time to do some extra stuff in pulling them out. So what that winds up looking like is we're gonna take all of our blocks, which you can see over here on uh, the left hand side, I said, give me all objects of type block reference in my current documents model space. I then took out just the first six because I didn't want to operate on everything at once to prove the point. So once you have all the things that you want to work on, you're going to get the transform of each one of those block references. That's step one. Then you're going to go ahead and get the block from the block references. That's step two. Step three is going to pull the blocks objects, the things that are drawn inside that block editor environment. Step four is to get those objects geometry. And then step five is to apply the transform back to the block. Uh, so it is a bit of extra steps. Uh, there are a few different ways uh, that you can sort of uh, get this out um, and uh, pull that content down uh, pretty quickly. And uh, so I really like that this slide accidentally totally built on top of yours, where it was like, if I do this on everything, my computer's going to be thinking for an hour and a half, uh, as opposed to let's just take those first six. So um, as you can see here, uh, we were able to. Uh, Build on top of each other, which is always nice. Yeah, uh, not like your traditional filtering per se, but just taking a subset of things to make a point is also a form of filtering. Yes. All right. So if you're here last time, you'll see this slide is pretty similar, but mapping out your process is really important as well. So instead of just jumping into the deep end of the pool and just starting and following your nose, which is one option and, and how I have personally done many different graphs in the past. I have learned sort of slowly over time that I want to get to my destination faster. It's actually better to have a map of where you want to go. So you know you have a starting point, or you know you have an end point. And what you want to do is figure out the steps that it'll take in between to get there in a sort of pseudo code method. So on screen right now, you'll see that we have a starting point of a piece of geometry in the upper left. And then we have the end result of a derived set of uh, structural sort of uh, reference geometry on that form. And what we wanted to do is really map to get to that place. So we know we've got a starting point of geometry. We know that we want to get to this end result, but there's actually different ways we can get there. So having a plan is really important. You can put down things like, what do you know that, that is true right now based on your knowledge set? What do you not know? What is an unknown? What is something that you need to maybe put some time into thinking about? Well, maybe you just need to follow your nose on that piece and figure it out along the way. And then can you project what might actually come up in this process? Can you think a little ahead and try and understand where the problems may arise, where things like edge cases may creep in. You know, do you want to build this graph in a way that is specific to your particular project? Or do you want to sort of abstract this and make it way more generic so you can use this across multiple projects in the future? And if you want to start thinking and learning a little bit more about this kind of approach and methodology, please refer to our previous session, on how to plan a dynamo graph for a deeper dive on this particular topic. All right, so also, please, please, please do lean on your peers and let them lean on you. So we have an awesome, amazing community. So thanks to you all for participating in this and being a part of this awesome knowledge share. You know, I personally learned a lot when I first started my Dynamo journey, and then I try to give back as much as I can, and Jacob is in the same boat. And so what's really nice is everybody sort of wins in this scenario. If you're teaching, you get to understand how to teach better. You get to understand the concepts better. If you're learning, you get to move to your destination faster. And the notion here really is you're not really a one-person army. So 
the community and your colleagues and necessary and powerful tools to help you get to your destination much, much faster. So stand on the shoulders of the giants that have come before you, and then in turn, you can become a giant for those who follow uh, after you. Really awesome. The community is really the strength of Dynamo across the board, and we have specific categories inside of things like the forums dedicated to Civil 3D or dedicated to Python or dedicated to development. And you can go and peruse to understand what other people have done to either spark ideas in yourself or, generally speaking, uh, also potentially find the solution to your problem a lot faster than if you had to sort of follow your nose It's sort of only in an insular fashion trying to figure it out yourself. There's a wealth of knowledge that exists inside the forum, so use it. It is a very strong resource. Uh, what you can also do is plan with your friends or your coworkers or other firms or your future self uh, around how you want to consume that content in the future. This is things around notes and annotations being a must. Uh, you know, not only do you need to sort of like explain uh, you know, how your, your logic is working uh, for, your, for others, but also for yourself in the future, if you come back to it three, four, six months, 12 months into the future and, you know, say, I'm no longer no, not contextualized to what I was doing. And now I know no idea why I approached it in this particular fashion. So you cannot over document, document code or dynamographs. So please do lean into writing notes and groups and annotations around what your thought process was when you're trying to create content. Next up, community packages, right? Uh, as Sol mentioned before, uh, you're gonna go much further if you stand on the shoulder of some giants. So uh, utilizing packages are an absolute must. There's just too much amazing stuff out there to just skip over. Uh, so what I recommend is building and maintaining a deployment plan for the common packages that you're gonna use. Uh, deploy that locally to the user's individual system as a best practice one library for each Dynamo version that is installed on the system. Uh, you also wanna make sure that you're taking the time to teach your colleagues to put stuff in place when it's been needed, right? Uh, the workspace extension uh, in the later versions of Dynamo, so correct me if I'm wrong, that was in 2.8 or 10? 10? 10? Okay. 827 was the first iteration uh, and then it's been significantly improved from 210 onwards. Nice. All right, so 2.8 on, uh, 210 even better. Uh, we've got that workspace extension to help people put those in place when they're missing, uh, but it's definitely uh, worth taking the time to uh, sort of plan that out uh, and make it so that users don't have to find everything on their own. But we do want to make sure that we're teaching the users how to find those pieces when something doesn't work out. Uh, some popular packages that I highly recommend, uh, the Simple Toolkit from Paulo Serra. Uh, I, I feel like I can't really go more than like 15 inches into civil 3D world uh, without going, oh, I want that node. Where was it? Oh, yes, civil toolkit uh, just about every time. Uh, there's also a great new package out called Camber from Zachary Jensen, uh, who's extremely active in that Dynamo uh, form community. Uh, so definitely worth checking that out, as well as Adam Riley's uh, packages here. And I saw him in the chat earlier. Hope he's still around. Uh, he's got his sheet set manager as well as civil DYN nodes. Uh, but I found both of those to be very, very useful in the past. Uh, so uh, just shout out to you, uh, Adam. Uh, thanks for, for doing such a great job and uh, contributing to the community like that. And uh, apologies for the misspell on your name, Adam. That's on me. Um, I'll do better next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving on. Uh, yeah, you've seen worse, cool. Um, I'm glad I wasn't the worst. So moving on, being mindful. So whenever you're working at anything, and Dynamo included and Dynamo Civil 3D included, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. So be mindful of the, uh, the reasons why you're making a choice or the reasons why you're trying to get to a destination. So most of the stuff that you can't do in the Civil uh, 3D UI can't be done in Dynamo. This is, this is true because Dynamo, and Dynamo nodes are references to the API of a host program. So in any host that we have, Dynamo can't magically go and do a bunch of different things that the host program can't do. What it does mean, Dynamo can sometimes do things that aren't expressed in the UI because there are APIs that, that exist in host programs that may or may not be used inside of that host program in ways that you can engage with them as an end user. So be mindful that you know, Dynamo is not magic, but also that you, uh, should not necessarily do something if you find an API that you want to use because maybe it's hidden for a reason or maybe it's a, it needs to be used in a very particular way. So if you see the image on the right, maybe you could do stuff like this, which causes uh, damage to your file and that's not a place any of us want to be. 
Also, some of the stuff that you can do in the API and the UI cannot be done by the API. So there's some very sort of minute cases where uh, the inverse is true. So limits of what can be coded effectively because potentially it's only available in the UI, which means that Dynamo's uh, landscape of possibility is not 100% based on what you see in the UI itself. It's, it's you know, a, a good chunk of it, but it's not 100% there, but it's also potentially be deeper than the UI in other ways. So the, that matrix gets a little bit funky. And then finally, before we get on to the awesome live demo that Jacob has uh, planned for us today is playing with all the toys. So blasting out content for others to use inside of Dynamo is fun and awesome. Either you can work for yourself or you can work for other people and give your content to others. So Dynamo has a few different integrations with Civil 3D, uh, one kind of pseudo integration, which we'll talk about in a second. But first of all, Dynamo for Civil 3D is really what we've been talking about today. So this is the best known integration into Civil 3D. This is similar to Dynamo Sandbox, adding in those AutoCAD nodes and adding in those Civil 3D nodes. So extended by those. But we also have the expression of Dynamo Player as well. So Dynamo Player has uh, an expression of Dynamo that is consuming a graph that you've created or that you know somebody else can consume it, you can consume it yourself. And this means it is headless, which is it doesn't have to spin up the Dynamo user interface to be able to be used. It can simply consume it in a new simplified interface, which is the Dynamo player. And that means it is faster because it doesn't have to render a bunch of different things on screen and load all of that UI or user interface content. It also means it's more user-friendly and you get to design a script in a way that you know the user only engages with and interacts with certain small pieces of your inputs, uh, runs, makes some choices, runs the graph, and then has an output to it. Uh, do note that Dynamo Player is uh, being upgraded in the next release of Revit, but we'll skip until the point release at least uh, of uh, Civil 3D. Uh, unfortunately, didn't make it into this one, but we're looking to upgrade the Dynamo Player experience in time on Civil 3D as well. The caveated one here is generative design, which is not officially supported yet inside of Civil 3D, but you can kind of make it work uh, if you want to. So if you're in the know, uh, or we could potentially do a specific session on this, and we might do later, Jacob, uh, around like how to sort of like hack uh, generative design and get it into the Civil 3D experience. Essentially, uh, Civil 3 uh, generative design runs on Dynamo. Therefore, if you put things in the right location, you'll be able to get generative design running uh, in Civil 3D as well. Caveat is some of the specific uh, generative design applications inside of the UI for Revit uh, may not transfer across. Yeah. Uh, it's it's not too hard to get, a, get it in the Dynamo environment. And once it's there, you can get a lot of stuff done, but you will not have that snappy little Revit uh, uh, add-in sort of integration, uh, unfortunately. All right, let's cue up that danger music. This is truly dangerous because I know Dynamo, but I'm not a civil expert. So if I start to do anything that seems crazy, uh, put it in the chat so I don't make too much of a fool out of myself. Thanks, everybody. All right, let's go ahead and kick it off. You can see I've already got Dynamo launched. Uh, we've got uh, blank civil drawing. I've got nothing in, up my sleeve, nothing in the drawing at the moment. I just zoomed extents a couple times to prove that. Uh, and we're going to start by basically building a little brick pathway, uh, maybe with some bigger bricks than normal. But I'm going to go ahead and create a new file. Uh, and uh, Again, we, we talked about this a little bit. You can see we've got the AutoCAD section of the library over here, the civil section of the library down below that. I've got my standard add-ins, Civil 3D Toolkit is here. Uh, I've tried to keep things pretty light in terms of my uh, add-ins, uh, so I don't have any of those other great packages we talked about installed and ready, uh, but I did want the Civil 3D Toolkit here and some other stuff that I was just playing around with before uh, this all started. So first thing that I'm gonna do is we're gonna make a fun little curve. Um, so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to make a point by coordinates. And this is creating not a civil 3D point. This is a dynamo point, right? Uh, and you can see when I put that on, because I'm in automatic run mode, uh, it automatically set up those uh, sliders so I can move this stuff around. But I don't want just one point. I want a bunch of points. So I'm going to start at zero, and I'm going to end at 30. And I'm going to do that, oh, what do we think, 10 steps in between? Seems like a good number. Uh, and that will take care of my X values for my points. Uh, so we'll wire that in there. And you can see I now have 10 points starting at zero, ending at 30. Uh, the next thing that I want to do is I want to have some sort of variation in how this moves through the landscape. So I'm going to start with a math.random function. Uh, actually, we want a random list. And we're going to make 10 random points 
And I'm gonna multiply that, whatever those values come back as by two. And now when I do this, we've got a random little happy path of points. Now, still not yet something that I can really work with in Sybil. Um, feel free to laugh. Laugh loudly, yes, please, please, Adam. Laugh very loudly at me, I deserve it. Uh, all right, so from here, uh, I've got these points. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna make a NURBS curve. Uh, by points. And it's gonna go from end to end. We'll zoom extents on this geometry. I still haven't put anything into civil. Nothing there yet. And I shouldn't have minimized that all the way. I just click there. But we're going to start to get a little bit more complex here. So uh, when I, if I wanted to move this over into AutoCAD, I've got a NURBS curve. There's no such thing as a NURBS curve in the civil environment. I could come in here and I could look for, you know, polyline. Well, there's some stuff there. Object by geometry. We talked briefly about this. We could take some geometry. It's looking for a layer. I'm going to put just zero as a string. So this would try and write that to layer zero. And then it's looking for a block, which is going to be under document current model space. We talked about before. A lot of things need both the current document and the model space. This gets me that block. And then we would write that in and I get null. Nothing's being added. And the reason is that this NURBS curve geometry type hasn't actually been added into Dynamo just yet. It's still got a ways to go uh, before that uh, gets out there. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to fake it. I'm going to take this NURBS curve and I'm going to use a uh, curve dot points at parameter. Points at equal segment length. And we're going to take our original curve, and I'm going to go ahead and grab 100, 100 points all spread out all along that curve. And then from here, if I look over and think through those other object types that I had from my standard AutoCAD objects, we've got a polyline, and we can create a polyline by points. So now I've got a list of points, I've got a layer zero, and I've got a block. And this actually created a polyline, not a poly curve, different data type in Dynamo versus Civil. We'll pull this over and down out of the way. And then I'm gonna zoom extents so that we can see what we've made. And there it is, right? And yes, it's you know segmented, which isn't great, uh, but it kind of gets the job done for now. All right, so now that we've sort of defined where we want that path to be, uh, I said, we're gonna try and make some bricks out of it, right? So uh, I'm gonna continue working with this nerve curve as opposed to the polyline uh, or whatever else I might define down there. Uh, we're gonna pull the length from that curve. And then I'm gonna build a range from zero to N stepping by one. Right, and this gives me that Nice little sequence, all the way up to 31. If we wanted to step by a different value, we could do like 0 0.5 here, whatever it might want to be. Notice we're counting a little bit differently there. We'll leave that at half. I think that's, you know, it's not too bad with 63 items. Now I'm going to come back and I'm going to say curve that coordinate system at parameter. I can now take my original NURBS curve. And I'm going to hide some of this geometry. Otherwise, it gets a little bit busy. And we're going to sort of put that content out there on that curve. So now we've got 63 uh, coordinate systems that have been generated. I'm only seeing a few. And that's because those end ones are sort of running long. And the reason for that is I did curve.coordinate system at parameter. What I really wanted was curve. I keep hitting my thing on my laptop. Coordinate system at segment length. So now with this, the right node matters. You can see how this content's sort of working out. Much better scale. It's actually on my curve. It does sort of flip flop the uh, axes that's uh, normal behavior in this case uh, not something to worry about based on the overall intent that i'm going to try and get through on the graph here 
so the next thing that we need to do is we need to uh, basically build up those coordinate systems uh, to sort of build our brick walkway. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to use a list dot take every nth item, and I'm going to take my original list. I'm going to take every other item. This will allow me to get that sort of brick step. So now I've got 31. Before I had 63. So every other one works out. Uh, and I'm also going to copy this down. Reason being is down here, I want to offset by one and then take every nth item. Right? So one half of the co uh, coordinate systems here, the other half up there. You can see one half. And when I turn this back on, fills in the gaps, right? Uh, now with those two coordinate systems, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, find what those x-axis is. So I'm going to just go into my library and I'm going to type CS and go straight to my coordinate section. Remember, uh, when we have those sort of uh, underlined sections in the library, that's actually a hyperlink that's going to bring me to that part of the library so I can find what it is that I'm looking for. Uh, and under coordinate system, we can pull the X axis from the, that coordinate system. And then with that X axis, uh, we could try and translate that coordinate system the original coordinate system on the X axis by distances of uh, 0 0.4 to uh, actually 0 0.4 times 3 to 0 0.4 times 3 by 0 0.8, right? And so this, again, builds that range from 4 times negative 3 to 4 times 3, uh, stepping by 8 units in between. And when I put that in, you can see I've got some new coordinate systems that have been placed, but they haven't been placed all the way through, right? We only did four of them. And the reason for that is we have to actually modify this to say use list levels, and we're going to work with the data down at level one. So this is going to take that distance and then move everything by that distance over and over and over again. So I'm up to 124 coordinate systems. So we're going to do this twice, once for the ones up here. And then if I highlight both of these, notice those wires are highlighted. I'm going to hold down shift on the keyboard. And we can just drag this down here. And now I've done the other set, right? So that shift key with the uh, content highlighted uh, will allow you to move individual nodes, uh, which is super duper handy, or individual wires from nodes. All right, so now with my two uh, coordinate systems uh, sort of created, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna make some rectangles. And there is a node if I search for rectangle by coordinate system width and length. So now I can take this individual coordinate system here, Oh, I got to make one other change here. I actually want to multiply this one by four and this one by four so that we've got a kind of a different number. Uh, so now I've got some rectangles and I can create those rectangles on those coordinate systems. The dimensions I'm going to use here, I had 0.4, so I think uh, 0.3 and 0 0.7 maybe. That might not quite look too great. We'll see. It's not bad, huh? I don't know. I don't hate it. Uh, I'm going to copy this down again, and then we're going to use the other coordinate system down here. And now I've populated those bricks, and I've got that brick pattern. It's sort of stepping. Uh, I've got a little bit of overlap here. That's not bad. Um, maybe. I don't know. Uh, we could sort of scale stuff up and uh, play around with things a little bit more. But for now, I've only made dynamo geometry, right? Like if I, if I go back uh, to my non-geometry view and minimize dynamo, I, I still haven't made anything here. I haven't documented the decision that I've made in terms of this pattern that I like. So how do we wanna do that? Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and um, I'm gonna just create some hatches. Uh, actually, before we do that, let's make, how, how much time do I have, Sol, Sean? 10 minutes? Yeah, you could, you, could, you could squeeze 10 minutes for your Rambo snake. My Rambo <laughs> snake? Okay. Um, so we're going to do kind of what we, uh, I'm going to have some fun here. We're going to kind of do what we did before. So I'm going to use a list.count. And this is similar to what we did with the uh, Revit session last week. 
with this count at level there. Actually, before I count it, let's join these two. List.create. No, list.join. Close. Set of rectangles one, set of rectangles two, list.transpose. So right now I've got kind of the linear selection of pieces. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna transpose that so that instead of a linear selection along the snake, we're able to just sort of look at one row of the snake, right? So that's all of the first row, so on and so forth. All right, so now we're gonna count how many items we have at each piece. I've got sets of nine. Uh, and with that set of nine, I'm gonna make a random list. I'm gonna take that random list, 288 random lists right there. Uh, and I'm gonna say, uh, is A greater than 0 0.5? And with this A greater than 0 0.5, I now have a bunch of true false values. We're gonna do a quick filter by bull mask. Take this list of points here in our mask there. And now I have two different sets of nodes, right? I've got a set of uh, rectangles here where the value on that random list was greater than 0 0.5 and a set here where it was less, right? From here, we can start to actually record the content back. I've, I've, I've kind of finished out what I want to uh, kind of design through. And the node that I need for this is hatch.bygeometry. All right. And when I put this out, if, if you were to sort of search for that, search for that without uh, clicking the wrong thing on my keyboard, uh, hatch.bygeometry is under hatch. And when I expand that out, this is under that civil 3D toolkit uh, package from Polisera, right? So that's the piece that, uh, that we really want there. I'm going to take my included items here. It's going to look for a pattern. The pattern that I'm going to use is solid. It's also asking for a scale, we'll leave that blank. Uh, rotation, we'll leave that blank. Layer, I'm gonna leave this, at, I'm gonna make the layer, uh, let's call it pavers one. And because of the way Paula sort of built this, I don't need to worry about the block, I can actually leave that blank. So we'll put pavers one in, solid in for my pattern, and then the hatch geometry. And if I pull this over, I've just created one half of the hatches. All right, up to the next group. We're going to go ahead and copy all of this. Before I do that, though, because I want to sort of not blow things up by uh, interacting with too many transactions at once, I'm going to switch that over to manual. Highlight what I want to copy, pull it down, wire my boundaries in. We're going to put this next set, pavers two. Run completed. And there's the rest of my papers. So now we've filled everything all the way out and you can see the contents there. And because they're on different layers, I can find papers amongst all the many different nodes and we can start to change the colors. So um, I'm gonna go with maybe like a pink, maybe not quite so neon if I can find one, that's not bad. And we'll go with a papers two go with uh, a baby blue. And you can start to have fun with that. A sim instead of just doing a random list like they did there for the math random, you could always do you know, something to kind of get that gradient effect, basically do exactly what I showed in that Revit session, uh, which is uh, useful to refer back to perhaps. All right, I, don't, I didn't see anything in the chat and nobody seemed to laugh at me. So either I did well or uh, <laughs> this was relevant. <laughs> Wait for Adam to reply on that one. <laughs> All right, any questions on anything from anyone? So if something doesn't make sense, uh, feel free to ask a question, feel free to post it in the chat or come off mute, put your hand up, more than happy to answer them. A couple of minutes to do so, otherwise we can round out the session. They are in awe of Jacob's uh, civil 3D mastery. 
<laughs> I like David. David's too busy taking it all in to laugh. Uh, I, I'll take that as I did a good job. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess we can. Uh, oh, something else popping in the chat. I did. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, all right. Let's uh, let's start wrapping it up. Alrighty. So more Dynamo sessions or more Dynamo office hours session, uh, sessions specifically. So again, every two weeks, like it has been happening, we're gonna to continue uh, to do so. So the next session, uh, this is an update, unfortunately, I did make a change after through the session, but the next one's gonna be on March the 17th. It's gonna be called Hosts of the Dynamo Party, which in essence is all the other flavors of integration that we have that are not Revit or Civil 3D like we saw today. So we're talking format, we're talking advanced steel, we're talking alias, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, then beyond that, on March the 31st, we're going to be building more with Dynamo, which is again diving deeper into the Revit and Dynamo connection. And beyond that, we'll be getting more civil with Dynamo uh, as well, which will be diving deeper into this connection between Dynamo and Civil 3D. With more to come down the pipes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob and Saul. And thank you for everybody for attending. Don't leave yet. I just pasted a link to a survey and also the main page of the community conversations. So make sure to RSVP to those and we are streamlining it. So you'll be able to sign up for all of the sessions in our next series. Right now it's one by one. So just make sure to go out there and RSVP and make sure you do the double. It's I know it's it's awkward right now, but RSVP, but also click that Zoom link to register for that, because without that Zoom registration link, you're not getting in. And apparently everybody in here right now got into the Zoom link, so we know you guys all passed it, but share the wisdom. Um, I'm going to also share some more community uh, options uh, on staying connected to the community, our groups, our forums, our blogs. We've got a customer blog. Um, how you might be a speaker for a community conversation, you can do what Jacob and Sol do. Um, you know, David, this is a great opportunity for you or, or uh, uh, Adam, come on. But, but anyway, um, so thanks again for everybody attending today. I will be sending that link um, with the, re with the uh, recording at the end of the session after I download it. And here, let me give you some more links in here. And again, please make sure to uh, support the community conversations and uh, we appreciate you. So thank you. Yeah, big shout out to all of you for joining today. Thank you so much for spending your uh, Thursday afternoon and or morning and or evening with us today for an hour or so. I uh, would look forward to seeing you next time. Hopefully you can come and hang out. If you've got any questions afterwards about anything you've seen today, please do post them in the community conversations thread. Uh, we'd be more than happy to get back to you on that one and or reach out across social media channels. I will send all the links out in with the links to the, the video today. Um, my machine is about ready to crater. I can't even copy and paste from my clipboard. So uh, it, it might be my dog sabotage. And he came in mid session and was not happy with me for some reason. It kept trying to knock my plugs. So mm -hmm. don't know if all they're right. related, but I'm going to blame it on him anyway. So thank you guys. No problem. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.